Good morning and welcome to Great Tree Zen Temple. Our talk this morning is called Returning to Interconnectedness. Um, but first, we will have the opening sutra. An unsurpassed, penetrating, and perfect dharma is rarely met with even in a hundred thousand million kalpas. Having it to see and listen to, remember and accept, I vow to taste the truth of the Tathagata's teaching. And now a brief statement about dana. In Buddhism, when Zen practitioners share their understanding of the teachings in practice, it is offered freely as a practice of dana parmita. Dana is a Pali word that means generosity or to give freely. And this practice is done without expectation of getting something in return. This is the spirit of speaking about the Dharma. Other ways to practice Dana is to offer support to those who share the teachings, to support places of spiritual practice, and to give without judgment or expectation when opportunity arises. Those who share the teachings at Great Tree do so on a Dana basis. Please support their practice by giving what you can. And I'm assuming that um, Genjo would like uh, donations to go to Great Tree. And if you would like to donate, it would be very helpful to Genjo if you would do so by donating in the other category. Um, next year, Genjo will be ordained as a priest. And there are certain costs that go along with getting him and and Great Tree ready for that occasion. So if you would like to um, go online to the donate now and give to, to uh, further Genjo's career. Let me see, Tejo gave me some other information. If you use the other category, then you need to send a note to Tejo at, where did it go? Tejo at greattreetemple.org. So that would be go to the donate now, pick other, and then send a, a note to Tejo to say what's for uh, for Genjo. And um, so that's Tejo at greattreetemple.org. Thank you. And now an introduction to Mr. Williams here. Trey Genjo Williams is an engaged Buddhist who has been practicing meditation and other mind-body practices such as Aikido and yoga since 2011. He received Bodhisattva precepts from Reverend Tejo in 2020, in which time he received the Dharma name Genjo, which means to actualize the way, to show up, be present. Good morning, Genjo. Good morning, morning everyone. Thank you, Lorna, for the introduction and the uh, Donna statement for leading leading us this morning. Um, yeah. So I asked Tejo what I should talk about today, <laughs> and uh, you know, she said, um, I think first she said talk about whatever, and then. And then she said, it might be good to talk, to continue um, what I started a few weeks ago. And so a few weeks ago, <clears throat> I talked about, um, I talked about a counseling framework. So I'm, I'm currently, I work as a therapist. I recently graduated um, from Lenore Ryan University um, with with a degree in counseling and uh counseling there's there's a, a a bunch of different approaches right i was i was pretty ignorant when i first got into the field and was like you know well a counselor is just a counselor it's just a counselor it's just a counselor and it's all the same you just go in and you, you do your thing but of course um 
that's not really the case. There's all, all different approaches and theories about um, how to help people, I guess, help, helping frameworks. And one that I'm, I'm really into is called relational cultural theory. And I've been part of a group uh, this past summer. We're finished now, but we, um, we've been exploring that um, and practicing it. You know, so reading about it, of course, but then also trying on the concepts for ourselves and, and embodying them, seeing what it's like to incorporate some of the, the teachings of relational cultural theory into our lives to see what comes up. And um, really, I think at the core of it um, and why I'm so drawn to it is um, it teaches us to return to interconnectedness. Um, and the kind of foundational principle in it is that we grow and we move um, through and towards connection. Um, and it really, it evolved out of, of a response to our dominant Western culture that is hyper individualistic and um pretends that we're not um interconnected with all beings um and so relational cultural theory um answer to that in the western psychology world was kind of, we are <laughs> um we are interrelated um, in so many words, and they're one of the found, founders of the theory. Her name is Janet Surrey. She's a she's um, a practitioner in the Vipassana insight tradition, and so she's done a lot of work on um, merging the two, Buddhism and relational cultural theory, and that was one of our um, core texts that we used over the summer. It's called relational psychotherapy, relational mindfulness by Janet Surrey. And um, I'm happy to, to share that with you. It's available for free online. <clears throat> and so that's what I talked about a few weeks ago and my understanding of that. And, um, and so I put together today a PowerPoint um, to help maybe, I'm a very visual person. And so sometimes having the visual helps me. And so there's that. Um, and I've also been reading a few texts that will probably be woven into this. <laughs> I'm not sure how yet, <laughs> um, but I'm sure they'll emerge. Um, but I've been reading this book. I think y'all can see it. It's called Long Quiet Highway by Natalie Goldberg. Is anyone familiar with it? Yeah, a couple people. Um, my therapist told me about it recently and uh, he rarely, we've been working together for two years and he is very, what we call um, in the, in the psychotherapy world, um, non-directive. There's kind of a, a duality directive versus non-directive directive on the more directive side would be, we're going to do this and then this and then this. And the, the therapist is really directing the flow of of the the therapy and non-directive is we're just going to kind of show up and see what happens and let things emerge and he's very non-directive um but we had a session a few weeks ago and he was like you need to read this book <laughs> it's <was> very directive <laughs> and so i was like okay i'm paying attention to that um and uh you know, he and I have talked a lot about um, Buddhism and my practice and, and the lineage that that I'm a part of and Great Tree is a part of the Katagiri Roshi lineage. Um, and so Natalie Gold Goldberg was a student of Katagiri Roshi's for several years. Um, and it's this is a book, it's, it's kind of an autobiography. It's kind of... Um, um guiding um helping folks with their writing practice she's a writing teacher um and in it she talks a lot about 
there's a section that she she talks a lot about her time in Minnesota and her time practicing with the Minnesota Zen Center and Katagiri Roshi. And um, I've really loved um, getting to know him through her um, better. You know, um, Heijo talks about him often. And uh, so I feel like I know him in a way. Um, and then this, this uh, Natalie Goldberg talks about him quite a bit as well. And Tejo talks about this too. Um, Natalie and Tejo both talk about, sometimes they couldn't really understand Kanakiri Roshi very well, <laughs> whether it was his accent or uh, just what he was saying. But his presence, they talk so much about his presence and just how present he was. And Natalie talks about that quite a bit. Um, and so I've been reading that and um, and then I've been reading, um, it's edited by Andrea Martin, The Light That Shines Through Infinity, um, which is a, a um, are several of his, of Katagiri Roshi's, Roshi's speeches and lectures that he gave. Um, so yeah, I've been really, um, intentionally wanting to connect with um, our lineage and connect with Roshi. Uh, and one thing he one thing he's quoted as saying in, in Natalie Goldberg's book, she says that um, he said to the students at Minnesota Zen Center often, he told them, our goal is to have kind consideration for all sentient beings, every moment forever. And she goes on to say that that for him, sentient beings were everything. They were um, just looking around here, this laptop, my phone, this cup of tea, you all, um, the clock here, Tejo's reading glasses. <laughs> um, and of course, all those beings that we can't perceive as well. Um, and how Roshi was so present in every moment and, and he just took care of the moment and everything in it. Um, she talks about how at one point he was, um, she came into the to Zen Center and uh, he was watering an orchid and uh, just how that was everything. That was everything. There was just the watering of the orchid and how powerful that was and how, I think, I guess it was a few weeks old, the orchid, it had been a gift. And I don't know a lot about orchids, but maybe they don't live so long. Um, and how this orchid looks like it had, it was, you know, fresh baby, baby orchid, you know? It wasn't maybe showing its age. And she was amazed and he said, um, you know, when we take care of things, they, they last. Um, and so I've been thinking about that and really um, trying to practice that as best as I can, just taking care of, of everything. You know, I get really busy and I have a tendency to kind of do things mindlessly and ignore what I'm doing and I'm just like you know whatever it is um pouring tea and spilling it all over the place or like folding <laughs> you know a dishcloth all sloppily um not taking care of my life uh, in a way and um yeah so I've been practicing that and I feel very um, close to Roshi in that way through Natalie and through Tejo and of course I see it in Tejo as well um, how she takes care of life um, and it's a very moving teaching um, and an aspiration for me
Um, so relational cultural theory helps me with that too. Uh, it really, as as you might guess in the name, um, it it talks about relationships um, and it talks about the culture. And so we've all we all have cultures. Some are shared, um, some are not. Um, but these cultures inform our experience and inform um, how we move through the world and what we, our worldview, maybe what we hold on to. And so relational cultural theory, RCT for short, relational cultural theory becomes a mind, a mouthful, <laughs> saying it a lot. So RCT, um, it, it has helped me um, see what I'm holding on to, which has helped me let it go, you know. Um, I think that's so much of our practice um, in Buddhism is letting go, um, which is easier said than done. Uh, and sometimes uh, it's not up to us. Maybe I have the thought, oh, I want to let this go. <laughs> it's really hard. And it doesn't always let go. And I've, I've found it to be helpful that really getting really um, uh, precise about what it is that I need to let go of is helpful. And so RCT has helped with that. Many things have helped, but RCT is, is one of those. And that's what I said I'm going to talk about. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, and so I'm going to attempt to share my screen here. Let's see. Um, and now I can't see y'all. So let me. Um, let me do some things here. Sorry, just a minute. <laughs> okay. Can everyone see the screen? It, it says returning to moving with interconnection. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So in RCT, the language is moving with. Um, so that's there. And then I thought returning to. And I, I'm not sure which one I like better. So I put both. <clears throat> um, let's see. So, um, yeah, let me back up here. Um, a couple weeks ago, uh, I talked about, um, from an RCT perspective, we have strategies that we um, use to disconnect from each other and from ourselves. And I think there are really strategies that we employ um, when we forget the truth of interconnectedness. Um, and there's strategies that we employ of disconnection, but also of protection and survival. And so I don't think it's so much about eliminating these, but rather growing our awareness of them and of ourselves and when we're using them and how we're using them so that we have agency and we can choose to let them go or we can choose to use them if we feel like for whatever reason, maybe it doesn't feel safe enough or appropriate to let them go. Um, and so in relational psychotherapy, relational mindfulness, Janet, there are three strategies, major strategies of disconnection in this theory. Um, there's moving away, moving toward and moving against. Um, and some of the work that Janet Surrey has done is um, describing and connecting the three poisons in Buddhism. So greed, hatred, and delusion or um, willful ignorance uh, um, to these three strategies of disconnection. And so, these strategies of disconnection or survival, um, oftentimes they get, um, they're a response to um, shame or humiliation or 
oppression or um, a threat. We, we feel threatened in some way. And so we, when we're young, we, we have these strategies to protect ourselves, to take care of ourselves. And I'm going to talk about relational images a little bit later. Um, and so we have these strategies to um, protect, which is also to shut out interbeing, as Thich Nhat Hanh says, interconnectedness. And so there's a kind of dual side of it. There's they're protective and maybe necessary, um, and they shut us out of relationship. Um, and so moving away from relationship, from interconnectedness, um, looks like withdrawing, looks like hiding, silencing ourselves, keeping, feeling the need to keep secrets or even water down our experience, not really. Um, I think um, saying what we feel like we need to say. Um, there's moving toward, uh, which is trying to hold on to that connection at any cost, even at the sacrifice of ourselves. So people pleasing, appeasing. Um, and then there's moving against. And this in RCT, it's called a power over relationship where we um, dominate others in order to feel a sense of power versus our, in RCT language, um, the goal is more power with others. And so empowering others, which of course, returning to interconnectedness is to empower ourselves. Um, and so moving against counter humiliation or counter shaming, um, aggression, resentment, attacking back, kind of would be that moving against. And so all of these lead to, they're, they're protective and they aim to hold on to connection in a way, but they actually ironically push us further out of connection, out of interbeing, uh, greater isolation. Um, <clears throat> and so what Janet Surrey has done in her work is, um, just a second here. Oh, where did it go? Ah, oh, here. <laughs> um, she's connected the three poisons um, to the strategies of disconnection. And so she talks about greed as that movement toward relationship. Um, excuse me, I'm just looking at my notes here. Um, you know, this holding on to, it can look like maybe what we might call anxiety or really hooking our claws in and grasping um, and fear that um, we're going to lose something and, and um, lose the relationship or lose our connection. So we hold on to it by any means necessary. Um, and I think it's, um, it's that kind of, um, searching for something out of ourselves to fulfill us. Um, you know, Dr. Hun Lai, who's a local um, Tibetan Buddhist, um, and he runs Urban Dharma over in West Asheville. He talked about Buddhism in a, a few talks ago at Great Tree, so you can find it on YouTube. Uh, he talked about, during his talk on Waisak, um, Buddha's Buddha Day, he talked about um, Buddhism teaches us that happiness is an inside job. <laughs> you know, we tend to, in our culture, uh, I think our dominant culture in the West, uh, think external things will keep us happy once I get the, uh, you know, the job. Or for me these days, once I get that boba tea at the pop, then I'll be good. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> It's externalizing our happiness uh, and it can look like greed, um, needing more and more and more um, in order to be satisfied. Uh, hatred as moving against relationship, uh, othering, you know. Um, a she says it's a pattern 
um, of criticism or negative judgment. Um, <clears throat> you know, and um, Shohaku Okumura gave a talk on the precepts and he talked about how all the three, these, there's kind of dual sides to these three poisons and it, it can be easy to fall into judgment of the three poisons, <laughs> which is, uh, would be, I guess, considered poisonous in and of itself. And, uh, you know, um, how these are actually stepping stones to our liberation. And they, they um, can walk us back to ourselves and back to interbeing. Um, and that they, they exist for a reason. They have important things to teach us about ourselves and about um, the world. Um, I think Suzuki Roshi said once to under, you know, the, the best thing is to understand ourselves. And once we understand ourselves, we'll understand everything. Um, and so these are learning opportunities when we, when we get the opportunity of seeing how they show up in our lives. They're, it's good. It's a good thing. You know, I think it's, it's easy for me to beat myself up. <laughs> like, oh no, I was being greedy again, or I was hating again. Um, you know, ignoring things in my life again, uh, rather than see them as opportunities and how seeing is, uh, that's a cause for celebration, um, seeing how they show up. And so then she talks about delusion, this willful ignorance as movement away from relationship, pretending that things aren't the way they are. Um, withdrawal, detachment, and even intellectualization, um, come, you know, getting fixed on our story of what's happening rather than what's actually happening, um, you know, letting our wheels spin uh, rather than, you know, what Zazen teaches us is to let go, that let go of thinking. Um, what Tejo said, has said is, um, to allow the support of all beings to come through when we do that, instead of just spinning our wheels based on our own experience, our own patterns of thinking, our own habits. Um, and oops, here we go. Yeah, relational images. Um, and so I'll just pause for a second and let Y'all read this if you want, and then I'll I'll read it. Um, so I said I'll read it, but I'll just kind of instead give my understanding of it. Um, relational images occur naturally, and they um, they occur based on our experiences, based on our culture, um, and they basically they are ideas of how who we are in the world and how we can relate to others based on who we think they are. Um, and so they can be limiting. Um, it's that kind of intellectualizing that can happen of creating these judgments based on what someone says or what they look like or who our ideas about ourselves, how we can move through the world. Um, and they can, once again, they can be necessary. Um, they are necessary. Um, and they can be limiting and they can often exist beneath the surface and have an influence on our lives that we're not aware of. And so um, gaining awareness of them can help us to let them go should we choose, um, can help in that letting go process that we practice in Zazen um, and what give us the space to kind of see them coming, see them happening and choose to let them go 
Um, you know, one of the gifts I think of meditation and zazen is just is that space um, so that we can respond rather than react. Um, you know, I think that teaches us that non-reactivity. Um, and so there's this idea too of um, discrepant or what my mentor calls um, reparative relational images. When we have, when somebody does something in a, that is, um, we didn't expect is outside of our idea, I, our ideas of what is possible. They kind of help to shake that up, shake up our let go. They shock us. They kind of wake us up in a way. Um, there's a term as well called disruptive empathy, which is when we, um, when we are met with compassion, with empathy, when we don't expect to be, um, and how that disrupts, it wakes us up in a way. Um, you know, when we do something um, that we expect to be judged for or to be shamed for, um, to actually be met with compassion. Um, and we can do that for ourselves too. It's kind of going back to when we see the way that um, we're acting out our greed or our car negative karma, anger, hatred, delusion, um, instead of beating ourselves up and shaming ourselves, um, being really hard on ourselves, can we meet ourselves with compassion? And that helps to disrupt. Um, and it helps us come back to, I think, interbeing versus shame and um, judgment. Actually, it makes us, I think it makes us want to disconnect further. We're not worthy of being in relationship, not worthy of being in community, um, you know? And it's a cycle that gets us further and further away from the precepts, um, you know? Because we, these are our refuges, the community, Sangha, um, the Dharma, Buddha. <clears throat> and compassion brings us back. Um, so there's, there's the moving away, moving against, moving toward. And then RCT um, encourages us to move with relationships let go of our of the of those strategies um you know practice the openness the vulnerability the radical honesty um, the compassion that help bring us back and connect um, and it's what we do in zazen we see it and we celebrate it because yay we see it and then we let it go <laughs> you know and the gift of, of community and teachers and um, Buddhists who, who see these things in us too and help us let go, you know? Um, once again, I struggle with the letting go. And sometimes I think about it and I intellectualize about it, but it's much harder to do it. And um, it's helpful to, to, to have, to, to have it reflected back and to see it again and again and again. And each time maybe it releases a little bit more. <clears throat> and it all connects for me back to um, what Roshi said, you know, our goal is to have kind consideration for all sentient beings, every moment forever. Now it's that bodhisattva vow, the vow to benefit and embrace all beings until all beings are free, you know, keep coming back, keep coming back, even when we mess up, even when we don't want to, even when it's hard, um, you know, I think that's one of the, the great gifts of the practice too, and of Zazen, it, it is practice and continuing to show up again, even, even when we don't really want to, once again, that's where community, I think, is really helpful in a teacher, <laughs> that accountability. Um, and helps us connect to our, to the unseen world, too, you know. Um, you know, I think about 
this forever peace, you know. Roshi and others, our ancestors, are here with us too. They've made this commitment. Um, and can, when we open up to that and allow that support to come in, um, I think it can be really helpful. <clears throat> So I think I'll stop there and just open it up. Um, if anybody has any thoughts, questions, comments, um, please share. Thanks. There was one word in uh, one of the uh, things that you showed us. The word called, was flooding. I'm not familiar with what that means. Uh, flooding? Let's see here. Do you remember which uh, page it was on? <laughs> oh, oh, I see it. It's here. Yeah. A pa this one, right? Flooding. Yeah. I don't actually know what that means either. What do you think? <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Flooding in the face of vulnerability. I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, it's it's not a big thing. It was just, <laughs> you know, something I wasn't familiar with either. So thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I'll um, I'll look into that. Yeah, see what the literature says and get back to you. Flooding. I don't know. It makes me think maybe about um. I'm not sure, actually, yeah. Maybe the over overwhelming. I think about a flood being kind of uh, washing and just kind of moving through everything. Um, and uh, so much so that we've, we can't do anything. Maybe we feel stuck. Um, there's an idea in RCT called relational resilience. And basically it's... Um, our ability to um, withstand disconnection or um, difficulty. Um, I think about it in terms of Zazen, can we sit even when we don't want to or when we are feeling very overwhelmed with challenging emotions or a thought that we're really hooked to, can we just sit still and be with it? Um, and, um, because a lot of a lot of these strategies, I think, of moving away from interconnection happen when we feel like we it's too much, you know, um, whatever is happening is too much. So we need to get away from it. We need, however, we do that, whether it's literally moving away or um, kind of attacking or um, or um, appeasing, you know. I think they, I think they show up when, yeah, it becomes too much, maybe when we're flooded. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'll look into that. Thanks for that question. <laughs> I really appreciated what you had to say, reflecting what you said Shawaku had said once about um, the poisons being kind of um, learning opportunities or stepping stones. I feel like 
I've been noticing a lot lately that even in things that are supposed to be helpful and good for me, I tend to get really binary about those. And so then there's, there's this good or bad and right or wrong, which is for some of us is kind of deeply embedded anyway. So to maybe hold that a little bit more lightly, it felt like that's what um, part of what you were saying. And I feel like that's maybe for certain personality makeups, especially, I think that can be really a really helpful reminder. So thank you for that. And Joe, um, when I first uh, moved to North Carolina, we moved here recently, and originally I was from Nebraska, and our teacher there was Nonine, and he was a uh, also a uh, Dharma recipient of Katakuri Roshi, and so when I discovered Great Tree um, and the lineage that you all hold there, I was very, as I've said before, I think, I don't know if in this, in this context, but I've said I felt like I was coming home to, um, and what I really appreciate today is for you having brought Katagiri Roshi back to the present, really, and brought his teaching into something that we can use all the time um, through your, your psychotherapy. And, and I really appreciate it. And thank you for bringing that to me because uh, that's what I've been looking for uh, recently. Thank you. I would also like to say thank you for today's lesson. Um, it's very timely just in my what I'm experiencing recently in terms of um feeling my feeling my overall shame um for things that I'm working through and and being paralyzed by that shame and and pulling away from the the connections with people and with Sangha of and so it's it's just reminding me again that um the the importance of this group and and feeling connected to something outside of myself and um and and looking at the teachings to to kind of help help move through what's going on personally so um, this was a wonderful message that I needed to hear today. So thank you. And also, if you haven't heard his first talk, which was excellent as well, um, it has been uploaded and it is on uh, Great Trees YouTube channel already. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lorna. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're all here. I think there's one thing about uh, Katagiri Roshi that I've been learning about. Um, we we read one of his uh, talks, his a booklet on uh, the precepts on uh, uh, lay ordination, and um, the fact that you're making it such a part, his his legacy, such a part of your understanding of things. He was a very intelligent and intellectual man. And yet everything you hear about him, you get the feeling that it, that he was just, he was so present um, that 
he didn't get locked up in his intellectualism. It was just so much a part of him. And then, like you say, how he how he took care of things um, that it's very warming. It's a very heartfelt kind of thing. And I'm, I'm glad that um, you're learning more about um, your heritage. And I am, too. Thank you through you. Um, and that it's it's something that um, won't go away. It'll still be here in all of us. Um, well, if there's nothing else, um, Paige, I think you're giving a talk next soon, next week or in the next couple of weeks. Mm, might not be until September and a uh, talk is it's sort of an ambitious way to say it. Mostly I lead people through um, yoga movement practices as a way to embody the teachings and the seasons, but uh, thanks for mentioning it. Yeah, look out for that and, you know, just bring comfortable clothes and we'll breathe and move. <laughs> yeah yeah they're really wonderful uh what you bring and what you offer gosh they feel so good and it's definitely um a helpful practice for me um and a nice balance to the the talking <laughs> yeah so yeah please yeah be on the lookout for that um and uh, i think that's it <laughs> Shall we give back the merit then? Yes. You can do the echo. <laughs> May the merit of this practice. May the merit of this practice. Benefit all beings. Benefit all beings. And bring peace. And bring peace. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone.